movie Shadowland, the British writer C.S. Lewis meets and falls in love with the American poet Joy Gresham. Shortly after Lewis and Gresham are married, Joy falls ill and is diagnosed as having a particularly aggressive form of bone cancer. What follows are months of treatment and hospitalizations and finally remission. During the months of treatment, C.S. Lewis spent a great deal of time at Joy's bedside, often deep in prayer. He was at the time a professor at Magdalen College, Oxford University. In one particularly poignant scene, Lewis, who was played in the movie by Sir Anthony Hopkins, is preparing for a lecture and he's surrounded by several of his colleagues at the university and they're congratulating him on the good news of Joy's remission. And one of them says to him, it's a, it appears that your prayers have been answered. And Lewis replies, in these many days of prayer at Joyce bedside, I have learned that my prayers do not change God. God changes me. I have learned that my prayers do not change God. God changes me. That's a powerful insight, is it not? Into the meaning and purpose of our prayer. Prayer is one of the spiritual practices that we're looking at more closely this Lenten season. Far too often when we think of prayer, we tend to focus on intercessory prayer, kind of like what I did with the children. Prayers of petition, prayers for other people and ourselves. We tend to focus on this notion of, of coming to God with our laundry list of needs and wants and concerns and requests, both for other people and also for ourselves. But prayer is really much more than that, isn't it? Or maybe much less than that, depending on how you look at it. Prayer is one of those ways where we get still and listen to God. One of the ways we open ourselves to God's power and God's presence in our lives. In our Wesleyan tradition, we often talk about the means of grace. Those practices or rituals or places or objects that help us access or, or open ourselves up to the transforming power of God's presence in our lives. Means of grace would include the bread and cup of Holy Communion, the waters of baptism, walking a labyrinth, reading scripture, and of course prayer. Prayer is a practice, it's a discipline that really and truly opens us to the healing power of God's love at work in our lives. Prayer is about showing up as it as much as it is about anything we might say. It's about making ourselves available to God. In prayer, we open ourselves to a relationship with God, a relationship that will not leave us unchanged. Prayer is about communicating with God. And again, that may or may not include words. There's an apocryphal, apocryphal story told of Mother Teresa in an encounter with a reporter. The reporter asked her, when you pray, Mother Teresa, when you pray, what do you say? Nothing, she replied. I listen. Well, then what do you hear? Nothing. God listens. Seeing the puzzled look on the reporter's face, she then continued, you know, if I have to explain it to you, you probably won't understand. Listening. We listen and God listens. It's deeper than a conversation with God. Perhaps prayer is better understood as just simply being open to God's presence already with us. In this morning's passage from Mark, we read about a woman with a 12-year hemorrhage, a woman who's desperate, 
desperate to find healing and wholeness. A woman whose, whose illness had rendered her ceremonially unclean, who for 12 years has been unable to enter the temple or the synagogue, those holy places, those places of worship in her day. A woman who's been marginalized and pushed to the edges by her family and friends, by her own community. We can imagine how broken she must have been and not just physically broken, but spiritually and emotionally and psychologically broken as well. She's desperate. She's desperate to be healed, yet even in her desperation, she can't quite find the courage to go to Jesus directly and ask him for what she needs. But she believes she believes that if she can just touch his clothes, the hem of his tunic, that that will be enough that she will be healed, that she will be made whole. So she summons all her strength and she does what she has the power to do. She seeks out Jesus and puts herself in a position to experience his healing presence by simply touching his clothes. And she is healed. But it doesn't stop there. The story continues with Jesus turning to her and acknowledging that connection, that connectedness that now exists between them. When she touched him, something went from him to her. There was a transfer of power, of energy, of some sort. And in the midst of all these people gathered and crowding around him, he knew and he experienced her timid touch. Isn't that also the way it is with us and God? When we put ourselves in God's presence and open ourselves to being touched by God, we experience some of the power, the healing power of God's love and God's grace in our lives. The story ends with Jesus promising that her healing was not just a physical healing. It was much, much more. Because with the physical healing began the other healing of bringing her back into her community and into her faith community. Jesus promises her that her healing would now be extended to all aspects of her life. And that larger promise of wholeness is received in that relationship that is formed between them that day. This woman realized healing or wholeness not only when the hemorrhage, the bleeding stopped, but when she finally looked into the face of Jesus. In that moment, she was lifted up from being one who felt like she had to sneak up behind Jesus and anonymously receive the gift of God to one who was recognized by and acknowledged by Jesus himself, who was not yet named, but was now called daughter. Again, that indication of a relationship that was formed that day. And it seems, I think, that her healing was not complete until he turned and called her. So perhaps this gift, the gift of this story, is that, it, that the healing we are blessed to receive in our physical beings can be, for sure, a very gift of God. Yet the healing that comes to us as our relationship with God deepens and grows and leads to a different sort of wholeness, which somehow permeates our entire beings and all of our relationships with others. Michael Linval tells the story of a close friend, a man of deep faith, he said, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease when he was still in his 50s. A young man, by my standards. The man and his wife prayed and prayed that he would be healed. Twenty years passed, and the man was now in the last debilitating stages of this wretched disease, and he was having a conversation with his friend Linval. And he told Linval that indeed his prayers had been answered. And Linval looked at him kind of curiously, and the man said, I've been healed, he said. 
not of Parkinson's disease. I've been healed of my fear of Parkinson's. Healing comes in different ways, does it not? And sometimes and always, I guess, the ultimate healing comes when we move from this life into the full presence of God. You know, as we said earlier in the service, even the most devout among us sometimes have doubts about the power of prayer. We don't always understand what it is or how it works. But again, maybe the mechanics of it all are not what's most important. It's merely our showing up and being in the presence of God. Ultimately, that's what makes us whole. That's what brings healing of a different sort. Because whatever the outcome of our prayers, whether or not we get the answer we are looking for, that very act, that very act of being entangled with God and with others through prayer does have power, and it has power bestowing healing benefits for us. Last Tuesday night in Coffee Chords and Conversation, we talked about prayer and what it means and questions we had and, and experiences that the various of, of us gathered around the table had. And, and, and as I listened to everybody, and, and it was a great time of sharing, one, two things came, kind of bubbled up. One was that prayer, through prayer, we do very much experience God's presence in our life. And the other thing was that prayer changes us. We don't change God, but God changes us in prayer. And again, we may not get that answer we're hoping for, but ultimately, we get everything we need. I was thinking about that in terms of what in our lives we actually have power or control over. Because the sermon, this sermon focus is about listening for our power. And that comes to us through prayer. You know, any therapist worth their money will tell you that the only thing we can really control in our lives is us. Our thoughts, our emotions, our actions. We can't control what someone else does. But we can control our thoughts about our life, our emotions, and those often go together. Our thoughts drive our emotions very often, and then those often lead to our actions. Those are the only things we can control. And if that's true, then it makes sense to me that prayer really is more about changing us than about changing God. The serenity prayer, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to know the difference. That's where I have a big problem. And no, the wisdom to know the difference. Wait a hell, I just messed it all up. Heck, God grant us the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the wisdom, the courage to change the things I can, me, me. There you go. See, I told you I had problems with that one. I even forget it. And the wisdom to know the difference. But truly, when we're at our best, when we put ourselves in God's presence, we open ourselves to changing, not the people around us or the circumstances. We open ourselves to being changed by God's interaction with us, by God's presence in our lives. I think C.S. Lewis learned about that, learned that about prayer during his wife's illness. The many hours he spent in prayer at her bedside opened his heart and his mind to God in a new way. It helped him to understand that we, we don't have to convince God to heal our loved ones or give us all we need to become fully human. Lewis learned that when we pray, we simply are opening our hearts and minds to the heart and mind of God as we know God through Jesus the Christ. When we surrender ourselves and fully open ourselves to God's love in Christ, then God is able to heal our brokenness. And then we can become, in turn, a channel of love for our loved ones and the world. So prayer is primarily about relationship, about a relationship between us and the one who created us. It's communion with the creator of the universe, a conversation in which we listen more than we talk. And prayer we are not only expressing what is in us, 
but we're allowing God to transform us into that person God intends us to be. And because it involves this relationship, prayer is going to look different for each person here. As each of us brings our own unique personality and our ways of relating to, our, to God, that uniqueness will invariably shape the nature of that relationship, the way it looks. <clears throat> but again, the important thing is that we show up, is that we find time to be fully present to God, to experience God's presence in our life, to listen and to hear, because that's how God's love becomes our love. And it's how we then become channels of God's love for a world, folks, that needs to know God's love. Thanks be to God. Amen.